Hello, I'm Kevin Plancher, and my charge today is to share with you this JBJS MRC course, Sports and specifically Shoulder. These are my disclosures, and these are some of the topics that we're going to share this morning. So why don't we start with shoulder anatomy? Remember the shoulder has multiple bones that it's comprised of. The scapula, the clavicle, and the humerus are some of them. The last ossification center to close in young men it turns out is the medial clavicle aged 20 to 25 and interestingly enough at five weeks of gestational age you can see it on a plain x-ray as it ossifies. Remember that one-third of the shoulders motion is scapiothoracic while two-thirds is glenohumeral. Louis Bigliani and others helped us describe the shape of the acromion from type 1, type 2, and type 3 and we're going to talk a little later about the importance of the type 3 acromion and how it impacts patients with impingement syndrome and rotator cuff tears. Most of the time the acromion fuses, but at times in 3%, so rare, but 60% bilaterally in those individuals, an osacromonale can be found. And this unfused secondary ossification center is located at its most common site between the meso and the metaacromion. The sternocubicular joint plays an important role in the shoulder. And you must distinguish between joint injury and physeal fractures. Remember that the epiphysis ossifies at age 18, while the physis closes even later at age 23 to 25. When talking about the sternocubicular joint, it's important, like the AC joint, to remember that its primary stabilizer and most important part is the posterior capsule and its ligaments. Speaking of the posterior capsule, it gives you the most restraint to stability. And when sectioned, you can see posterior translation to occur up to 106% of that de increased length. The arteries that occur around the shoulder are many, but the axillary artery, remember, is divided into three regions, and we use the pectoralis minor as a midpoint. If we're medial to the pectoralis, we think of the superior thoracic artery. If we're lateral to the thoracic trunk, we're going to talk about the thoracoacromial trunk and the acromial branch specifically, which we'll be careful about when doing a distal clavicle resection. This artery in part three, lateral to the pec minor, has two branches that are important, the anterior humeral circumflex and the posterior humeral circumflex. Recall that the posterior greater tuberosity is supplied by the posterior humeral circumflex and its posterior inferior head at 64%. When we speak of the primary blood supply, the literature has changed somewhat that we know that the posterior humeral circumflex supplies 64% of the humeral head, while the anterior humeral circumflex does supply the proximal humerus, and so think of it when a patient has a proximal humerus fracture and it's disrupted 80% of the time. When soft tissues, there are dynamic and static stabilizers of the shoulder. The dynamic stabilizers might be thought of as the rotator cuff. It works in a mechanism of the concavity compression mechanism. That is, the ball is squeezed into the socket using a negative intraarticular pressure with aid from the static stabilizers, the labrum, which if you think about as a golf tee, when the sides of the golf tee are present, the ball stays on the tee. No different in the shoulder. The shoulder is stabilized by the labrum as it increases its depth up to 50%. Ligaments that play an important role in the shoulder stability is the coracohumeral ligament. It is the primary restraint to inferior translation and multidirectional instability, as we will speak about. And the coracoacromial ligament plays a large role in the elderly patient to prevent anterior superior escape in that rotator cuff deficient shoulder. When thinking about the glenohumeral joint ligaments, the superior glenohumeral ligament will resist that dislocation anteriorly with the arm at its side or adducted. The middle glenohumeral ligament will resist anterior translation of an arm at 45 degrees of abduction and external rotation. And one of the most important ligaments is the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, which will resist anterior inferior translation with the arm at 90 degrees of abduction and external rotation, almost like cheese it, it's the cops. Inversely, the posterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament 
is thought to resist posterior translation and inferior translation with the arm down at its side and internal rotation. The open rotator cuff, uh, rotator interval was discussed with Codman years ago with the supraspinatus superiorly and the subscapularis inferiorly. Today we talk about the arthroscopic rotator interval and its important contents, the biceps tendon, the coracohumeral ligament, and the superior glenohumeral ligament. It's important when you think of your patients, if there's laxity of the rotator interval, think of increased inferior translation. Think of a patient with multidirectional instability. On the other hand, if you have contracture of the rotator interval, think of a decreased range of motion or a patient that shows the symptoms of adhesive capsulitis. The brachial plexus is an important structure, and I'd just like to highlight a few of the nerves that are talked about more often than not in a recertification course. Here you can remember that the axillary nerve is off the posterior cord. It's posterior to the axillary artery, and that's why it's not affected as much in a traumatic uh, knife wound. There is an anterior division that innervates deep to the deltoid, the anterior, the middle, and the posterior deltoid rarely. And remember clinically when doing a mini open rotator cuff tear with your lateral incision that the evidence has shown that from three to six centimeters at the lateral acromion to be cautious as you might find that branch of the axillary nerve. The posterior division has innervation and it's the axillary nerve to the teres minor. And when disrupted, you can find a patient demonstrating that hornblower sign as we'll talk about in a massive rotator cuff tear. The axillary nerve can travel with and through the quadrilateral space, the posterior humeral circumflex. Remember that the anterior branch, as we said, comes five to seven centimeters distal to the lateral edge of the acromion. And most importantly, clinically, in the operating room, if you want to move the axillary nerve away from the surgical field when placed in the beach chair position, then simply adduct the arm and externally rotate it. In a glenohumeral dislocation, we all do try to check in the office or the emergency room for any numbness on the lateral shoulder and the deltoid, and that's represented by the axillary nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve penetrates the coracobrachialis at three to eight centimeters distal to the coracoid tip. Its terminal branch is seen here in the left antecubital fossa, and the photo on the right is the lateral antebrachiocutaneous nerve. Overzealous retraction during open bank heart procedures or shoulder procedures can sometimes demonstrate, unfortunately, a loss of elbow flexion and loss of supination of the forearm. And when that occurs, one has to think of the musculocutaneous nerve. There are triangular spaces which contain the scapular circumflex artery and the triangular interval, more known to have the radial nerve and the profunda brachii in its interval. The suprascapular nerve comes from the upper trunk. It's innervated by the C5, C6 cervical nerve roots and is a mixed nerve with motor and sensory fibers. You can see here as the nerve enters the supraspinatus fossa through the transverse scapular notch that the nerve dives under the transverse scapular ligament, nerve, the navy, and the artery goes above. It travels towards the glenohumeral joint and then it dives medial to end in a distal branch to innervate the infraspinatus. And so when patients have isolated infraspinatus atrophy, think of compression of the spinal glenoid ligament. The supraspinatus begins by arm abduction the first 30 degrees and is innervated by the suprascapular nerve, while the infraspinatus I want you to think of takes care of external rotation at zero and 90 degrees, innervated also at the suprascapular nerve. And the teres minor is our another external rotator and is innervated, as we talked about, with the posterior division of the axillary nerve, yielding a hornblower sign when not functioning. The subscapularis is our primary and powerful in, uh, internal rotator, innervated by the upper and the lower subscapular nerve. The latissimus dorsi, another internal rotator, is innervated by the thoracodorsal nerve. And one of our last external rotators, the teri major, is innervated by the lower subscapular nerve, unlike the teres minor, which is innervated by the posterior division of the axillary nerve. The biceps, as it implies, two heads, has its long head origin off the posterior labrum and the superglenoid tubercle. 
while the short head has its origin on the coracoid, and both come together in a confluence at the bicipital aponeurosis, or tuberosity. When doing open surgery around the proximal humerus, it's important to remember that the latissimus dorsi, the lady between two majors, is medial to the long head of the biceps, while the pec major and the teres major are inserting at the greater tuberosity, the pec major lateral, the teres major medial to the long head of the biceps. So x-ray technologists can help you, and I encourage you to always avoid a routine AP seen in the middle image. Rather, try to get the true AP or the Grashy view so you can see you're not misled to think that there's glenohumeral arthritis, but rather the glenohumeral joint is open. A scapula Y is important to detect the acromion morphology, as we talked about, for a type 1, type 2, and type 3. It's essential to get an axillary view, and here you can see in the bottom right the loss of external rotation the patient would signify by having a bone-on-bone -bone relationship and seen in the axillary view. Obtaining an axillary view is not as difficult if you abduct the arm. Perhaps hold the patient, tell the patient to hold an IV pole, and then it can be obtained. Specialty views, like a Bergeneau view or a striker notch, can help you to detect the Hillsax lesion, so important as we'll talk about. And in an AP internally rotated position, the Hillsax lesion becomes evident. When talking about the AC joint, obtain a Zanka view at 10 to 15 degrees cephalad. The posterior dislocation in the emergency room is often missed, and you can help yourself and your colleagues by obtaining this axillary view or realizing the loss of external rotation seen when the patient presents. Imaging is helpful with advanced, like rotator cuff deficiencies, with an MRI. And when you detect the labrum, or cartilage, and if you have a bony lesion, always think about the CAT scan to help you to detect the amount in determining perhaps if you're going to go forth with a ladder J or investigating a fracture. Whether you do a beach chair position or a lateral decubitus position, it's important to understand in the beach chair position to know the cerebral perfusion may be decreased in this position. And open procedures are very easily converted in the beach chair position. If you're a fan of the lateral decubitus position, just recall that 35 to 45 degrees of abduction with 15 degrees of forward flexion can avoid any type of brachial plexus injury. Always protect the perineal nerve on the lower leg and do it yourself, and remember to place the axillary roll for safety. <coughs> Complications do occur, sometimes unfortunately with anesthesia, and in regional anesthesia the most common a uh, complication that's seen is a sensory neuropathy in an interscaling block. We as orthopedic surgeons can sometimes avoid things if we remember to place our posterior portal carefully to avoid the axillary nerve, the anterior portal to avoid the musculocutaneous nerve, and as we spoke about before, the lateral acromial portal to be mindful of the axillary nerve at 3 to 7 centimeters. When we discuss shoulder instability, we can start with the definition. Slap tears are those superior labral, anterior, posterior tears. The patient comes in with clicking, a dead arm perhaps, the throwing velocity is decreased, the distance is decreased. This is the overhead thrower that usually has a peel back or a biceps traction injury. Provocative testing has been helped by some of the signs, O'Brien's, but the sensitivity and specificity is not clear. And there really isn't any accurate testing. That's why your clinical acumen is so important. An MRI might be helpful with an arthrogram if needed. And associated findings is probably more important to identify the spinal glenoid notch cyst. Look for the atrophy in the posterior aspect of the patient. Treat the slap tear if it is seen there. And consider a cyst decompression if it is symptomatic. Dr. Snyder helped us classify these slap tears from 1, 2, 3, and onward, but we focus many times on the type 2, the torn anterior to posterior, the one pulled off the supraglenoid tubercle. Here you can see that treatment is not operative. Physical therapy and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories is very helpful for a treatment of a slap tear, but when or if one dives in for a surgical treatment, you can see here on the right photos the arthroscopic repair with sutures. <coughs> 
We think more in 2016 that it is the biceps that needs to be treated more often than not, as we'll speak about, rather than the labral tear. And remember that the 15 to 25-year-old professional or semi-professional thrower, if you fix a labral tear, most often will not return to their original level of sports involvement. As always in the slap tear, beware of the anatomic variants. Here on the top right, the cord-like thickened middle glenohumeral ligament should not be repaired. And if it is repaired, you will lose external rotation and extension. And below, do not close a sublabral hole, as that's a normal anatomic variant. This gentleman has a problem. He has the multidirectional instability, or the atraumatic bilateral, where he reports and needs to go to rehabilitation to help him more often than not, and in the rare circumstances, perhaps surgical treatment with an inferior capsular shift would be beneficial. There are other types of instability, for instance, the traumatic, the unilateral, or anterior, which a soft tissue procedure, like a Bankar procedure, can be quite helpful. It is the labrum that helps to deepen the articulation for an anterior dislocation, but once again, as you can see here, as this fire truck is held by this stanchion, the blood supply to the labrum or the slap tear is poor, and so it may tear quite often. You can see on the bottom right the labrum that is torn in an anterior dislocation, that anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, so common about 90% of the time. When one does have a bony bank cart, in addition to the soft tissue, remember there's a high recurrence rate. And while it appears all the time, the hill sacs lesion, that is that posterolateral impaction injury on the humeral head, it varies in percentages how much it is rather than it appears 80% of the time. Note for a haggle or a humeral avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligaments, as we'll talk about later and identify it on that MRI. Realize that an anterior labral ligamentous periosteal sleeve avulsion, and you can see here that the labrum has healed to the medial glenoid neck, poses a problem for the surgeon as there's a higher rate of recurrent dislocation when you fix it. The associated injuries with instability is important. If you have a patient greater than 40 years of age, I want you to remember that the rotator cuff tear is more often than not torn. And if you have someone older than that at 50 years of age, think of the non-displaced and look for it greater tuberosity fracture. The axillary nerve, while we check it in the office and in the emergency room, and loss of deltoid function by seeing no shoulder shrug is not common, but does appear about 5% of the time. And we can test for it by feeling the lateral side of the shoulder and its sensation, and it might be decreased. Physical examination on anterior instability is seen with apprehension, more often than not, and not pain. And whether, as you can see here, you do a relocation or augmentation, and in load and shift tests for anterior or posterior instability, it's important to be able to identify which direction the shoulder has gone out. Speaking of the load and shift test, remember to do this test performing it supine, not standing, to help stabilize the scapula. And realize if we do have anterior instability, it is the stretched or torn anterior band of infraglenohumeral ligament. Subtle instability can occur in the cocking phase, most often in professional or semi-professional throwers, as seen on the right. You can move towards imaging. X-rays, most often than not, might be normal. And the MRI is so helpful to detect the labral pathology. As we said before, the CAT scan can detect bone loss. Dr. Ito discovered for us and said in Asia that non-operative treatment is available, but realize societal changes. For him, returning to an emergency room after a dislocation was common within the first hour. And so brief immobilization in a sling in a position of external rotation and adduction worked to reduce the relationship of the labrum on the glenoid and in fact solved anterior instability. For us, physical therapy is important as a first-line treatment, especially for young people, but think of them and evaluate their ligamentous laxity. When conservative treatment fails or recurrent instability does occur, then operative intervention is important. And in early operative treatment for someone less than 23 years of age or in a contact athlete, beware of the wrestler or the swimmer because of recurrence, 
please assess the bony injury and defects so one doesn't have problems. One can consider, as we're changing now in 2016, to an open type Bancard soft tissue procedure rather than arthroscopic because of higher recurrence rates in some studies in contact athletes. Most importantly, whether you do arthroscopic or open, open treatment, re realize that randomized studies show no difference between the two. It's important not to take on certain procedures like a thermocapsulography because results will not be successful and we want to do the best for our patients. If you do do open treatment, some of the indications are an engaging, as we'll speak about, hill sex lesions. That is a glenoid defect greater than 20 to 25 percent. An inverted pair glenoid or a contact athlete, as we just spoke about. In Europe, it is more popular to do the latter J as a primary procedure, and here in the U.S., we seem to hold to an anatomic repair of soft tissue with a Bankart procedure. But what is clear, if you're going to do an arthroscopic treatment for anterior instability, you need a sufficient number of anchors, at least three to four, below nine or three o'clock in a right and left shoulder, Consider plication sutures if you evaluate there is additional capsular laxity. Try a low anterior portal to be truly perpendicular to the glenoid, and as always, to incorporate any bony deficiencies as you can so we don't lose that concavity compression mechanism that holds the ball into the socket. Technical errors can be avoided if you place your anchors not on the medial scapular neck, but replace them as the bumper, as you can see here, has been the problem. And recurrence can occur with anterior instability and its most common complication is dislocation related to age. Less than 20 years of age and non-operative treatment will have a recurrence rate of about 90 percent. Operative intervention when done, we have to be careful to avoid a subscapularis tear and so we're careful to put it back in an open bank card procedure but can be detected by the patient with a lift-off procedure. And as said as before here on the right, look at careful anchor placement on the bumper, not perhaps on the medial scapular neck. When there is bone loss, as Dr. Burkhardt helped us see, we know that recurrence rates in his own series was up to 64%, and to eliminate it, we have to take care of the bone. The latter J can help us. We can transfer the coracoid and result in restore the continuity of the glenoid. Remember that complications can occur with some loss of external rotation, whether it be to the musculocutaneous nerve, to the suprascapular nerve, with an avulsion fracture it's been seen of the choroid, or a non-union of the bone block. And so we need to learn how to do this procedure well. Glenoid loss greater than 20% can have failure of anterior instability if we don't deal with the bone loss. And performing an arthroscopic ladder J today is difficult and has very high complication rates, even in the expert's hands, and I would caution you and learn the open ladder J when needed. The glenoid track, as it's discussed, when thinking on track of the lesion is a good thing. It's non-engaging, and if there's a glenoid defect of less than 25%, a soft tissue procedure like an arthroscopic bank heart repair is important. If a glenoid defect exists, then greater than 25% bone grafting of some sort, sort must occur. An off-track lesion, as we speak about, is not good. It's an engaging defect where the glenoid defect is less than 25% and we do an arthroscopic rhomplissage as we've shown. Remember that when doing the rhomplissage to try to stay away from the valley or the medial margin of that Hillsax lesion so you don't lose, lose external rotation. Here you can see the hill sax lesion being demonstrated, and when it's greater than 40% in that posterolateral corner, it's recommended to prevent engagement of a lesion. We might add, as we spoke about, the anterior labral tear with capsular reinforcement and a bank heart repair. Posterior instability is more unusual. It comes with patients that have seizures, perhaps a motor vehicle accident, or a football lineman with his arms straight out in forward flexion, internal rotation, and adduction. Unfortunately, it's missed many times in an emergency room. The patient will present with a locked, internally rotated arm and loss of external rotation, and we need to help our colleagues to diagnose this with a good x-ray to understand the reverse hill sacs will be present. And on physical exam, one can see a jerk test for posterior instability. 
Here, seeing the poster instability demonstrated is quite sensitive. Remember, in poster instability, the clinical complaint is pain more often than not, not apprehension, as opposed to anterior instability, where apprehension is the main clinical complaint. Poster instability can be treated in a non-operative fashion with immobilization and strengthening of the infraspinatus during physical therapy. And if you proceed with operative intervention, an arthroscopic posterior bank cut repair can be done with a viewing portal anteriorly and a working portal down at 7 or 5 o'clock. Beware not to over-tighten so that we don't create anterior instability and as always avoid the axillary nerve, that posterior branch that stays within 3 millimeters of the glenoid. A posterior dislocation, though, when it's acute, can be closed, reduced up to three months. But if it's locked and chronic, think about when the humeral head is involved less than 30% of taking the subscapularis with the lesser tuberosity and transferring it into the lesion. If a defect exists and it's greater than 50%, a humeral head replacement is more advisable. Multidirectional instability is that atraumatic bilateral problem that a patient says, well, I carry a suitcase and my arm drags down. Look for generalized ligamentous laxity or hyperextension of the knees, elbows, and thumbs. Look for the voluntary dislocator. Here you can see one of the physical signs, the sulca sign, in a patient that has multidirectional instability. And remember that the stretch bands of the anterior and now the posterior infraglenohumeral ligament will be present. Look for ligament astaxity or blue sclera on a patient that may have a subtle erlos danlos. Hyperextensible elbows are also common. For the times that you do operate, realize that a multidirectional instability patient often has an absent or deficient labral pathology. Our swimmers are very commonly seen with multidirectional instability. Non-operative treatment can be very helpful with physical therapy. Strength, uh, strengthening the rotator cuff for about three to six months, and scapular kinematics are very important to see. An inferior capsular shift with surgical treatment or a pan capsular application can be helpful in operative intervention, and stiffness, even when tightening it, is very rare in these types of patients. Impingement comes in three varieties these days. You can think of external or the classic or primary subacromial impingement where the supraspinatus is compressed under the greater tuberosity or the CA arch. In throwers, I want you to think of internal impingement in abduction and external rotation where there's contact of the posterior rotator cuff and the posterior glenoid. The classic signs of physical primary external, uh, excuse me, primary subacromial impingement of a near sign, Kennedy Hawkins sign, or a painful arc of motion can help diagnose this as we have compression of the cuff on the undersurface of the acromion. Treatment is seen with an injection, and accuracy now in the literature has been shown that an anterior injection more than a lateral and more than a posterior can help with accuracy to treat subacromial impingement. Please note, if you're doing an arthroscopic subacromial decompression, the deltoid is violated at any small extent. Here we see what we started about and talked about early, that there are types of uh, chromium, type 1, type 2, and type 3. And it is the type 3 acromium that persists at 40% in our population. It is hooked and is associated with a 70% size of a rotator cuff tear. The MRI could be helpful, as seen in the bottom left here, to once again show that the rotator cuff may occur at 70% from the impingement of this hooked type acromion. At subacromial impingement, there are many theories, and in 2016, scapular dyskinesia, as popularized by some, is present, and it's thought at sometimes one of the mechanisms is the pec minor is shortened or contracted, which gives an anterior tilt of the scapula resulting in impingement syndrome. And so therapy and non-operative treatment would be wise. Internal impingement is a mechanism of an unbalanced glenohumeral joint. Notice on this young man, he has an arc of range of motion, but he has excessive tightness of the posterior capsule. He has a frayed posterior cuff with a partial articular surface tear at the junction of the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. The tear is usually seen in the posterior superior labrum, and sometimes you can be lucky to see a bony lesion or a Bennett lesion. 
Here you can see the Bennett lesion or the glenoid exostosis, and scarring of the posterior capsule exists. The posterior cuff is entrapped, and the partial articular surface tear is present with a superior labral impingement. The throwers and their source of injury is in late cocking, which affects that posterior superior labral tear. Less common is pain at the early acceleration phase. When you do examine a patient with internal impingement, they have the glenohumeral internal rotation deficit, or that internal rotation that's decreased with a tight posterior capsule, or GERD. We define it as 25 degrees as side-to-side -side loss of internal rotation. External rotation will be increased, and more often than not, we can find in asymptomatic throwers a humeral retroversion. By all means, obtain that MRI, look for the posterior labral tear, look for the cuff tear and that partial articular surface tear, or just fraying, as you can see on the top right here. Physical therapy can help GERD. We can strengthen the subscapularis and the serratus anterior. We have to stretch out that posterior inferior capsule with exercises like a sleeper stretch or the pec minor. And at some rare times, an injection intraarticular or subacromial can be helpful in the treatment of internal impingement. When physical therapy fails after a lengthy process, a capsule release can, can help to release that posterior inferior capsule, perhaps a debridement of the labrum, and avoid repairs as we've spoken of before in throwers because they don't seem to return to their original sport if fixed, and think about a pasta repair that is a partial articular surface tear repair or just debriding those fibers as they're hanging down. The rotator cuff can be torn. It is age-dependent. Trauma affects a rotator cuff in a less than 40-year-old. And more often than not, it is non-traumatic in a greater than 60-year-old. The patient will present with pain or perhaps a chronic ache. They may demonstrate a sleep disturbance. They may say it's difficult to do overhead activities. And I would like you to remember the special category patients, the overhead worker that can have a very common rotator cuff tear or the unfortunate spinal cord injury patient that has overuse from using the wheelchair and demonstrates a rotator cuff tear that truly needs this fix to get around in activities of daily living. Range of motion can be limited when a rotator cuff tear occurs. Pain or weakness may occur. Strength testing can be finite weakness depending on which rotator cuff is torn or it can be global. If one cannot initiate the first 30 degrees of abduction, it's the supraspinatus that's affected. If external rotation is affected, it's the infraspinatus. And if the subscapularis is torn, it's increased passive external rotation with the arm at the side with decreased internal rotation strength. Speaking of the subscapularis, it's important to diagnose on physical exam, and there are several tests that we can use. The liftoff test demonstrated here detects the lower subscapularis deficiency. Unfortunately, it's only sensitive approximately 20% of the time. And there are other tests that are more efficient, and you need 75% of the subscapularis torn when the patient cannot lift their hand off their back to truly be helpful. The belly press and Napoleon test also tests the lower subscapularis. It has a 40% sensitivity. It's a positive test with the flexed wrist, extended arm, and we exert a force on the lower abdomen with the affected upper extremity. The elbow may not drift towards the body. And if 50% of the subscapularis is torn, this test will be helpful. Dr. Burkhardt helped us with the bear hug test, which has a higher sensitivity than the previous test described. And it's only necessary of 30% of the subscapularis to be torn. And in fact, this test, depending if you have flexion at 45 degrees or flexion at 90 degrees, can detect an upper or lower subscapularis deficiency. Well, if you have a partial subscapularis test, they're often not reported. And in studies, the sensitivity and the presence is quite high. Beware when you have a partial subscap tear that you might have a torn or sublux biceps. And this does need treatment as the patient will complain of pain in the front of the shoulder. Here you can see the axillary views with the biceps out of that notch. And if that subscapularis is torn, there's nothing better than finding the commissine, which will help us to see where the biceps is medially displaced, 
The comma sign represents that evulsed superior glenohumeral ligament and helps to find the most superlateral aspect of the subscapularis tendon to help us know where to place it back. Partial or incomplete tears of the subscapularis in an arthroscopic view are difficult to detect. You might want to use a 30 or even a 70 degree scope in a neutral position or abduction internally rotated to evaluate this. Try not to underestimate the tear as these can be very uh, problematic for patients and we need to repair them. Others have classified partial rotator cuff tears as we've talked about full thickness rotator cuff tears and I think it's important just to describe as articular or bursal sided tears. Here you can see that posta lesion we spoke about in the young overhead thrower that has internal impingement. It's a silent lesion more often than not because of the deceleration phase of the rotator cuff it's an eccentric load failure and in deceleration or in the follow through phase can occur that is the partial articular surface tear. These tears when they occur if greater than six millimeters is exposed equate it please to 50 percent of the thickness and your treatment choice at that time is either an insight to repair if you'd like or completing the tear and repairing this partial articular surface tear now. Pasta lesions that are less than three millimeters exposed with a bursal side that's intact can be treated non-operatively or perhaps debrided or perhaps if indicated a subacromial decompression and newer procedures are being experimented with but we don't have long-term uh, data yet in repairs with certain patches laid on top. Then why do some rotator cuff tears hurt more than others? Please realize as seen here in the stress strain curve that bursal side tears hurt much more than articular sided tears. And the reason is the bursal sided tears and their bundles undergo greater deformation prior to failure because they have greater tensile strength. Therefore, pay attention when a bursal sided tear occurs or when pain is present by the patient. Articular sided tears, as we say, are more often than not silent. So, articular sided tears greater than six millimeters need an indication for a repair and do get repaired. And bursal sided tears, though smaller at greater than three millimeters, should be considered for operative intervention. Near full thickness tears, when reported by the radiologist, should send off a red signal that beware of a concomitant tear on the opposite side and please examine both shoulders. Here you can see a full thickness tear on the left of a rotator cuff in this MRI and a partial thickness tear where the MRI can help identify these lesions. More often than not on some of these exams and recertification it's important to remember to start studying the sagittal view and here you can see the subscapularis or getting facile with the ultrasound to detect partial thickness rotator cuff tears here in articular sided tear seen on the right. In any event, understanding fat atrophy or the Goutelier classification is so helpful to understand the success of outcome. The more, that is, with equal fat and muscle or more fat than muscle, be cautious. Warn your patients, warn yourself that outcomes may not be as successful and re-tears can occur with a rotator cuff tear. Non-operative treatment st can still be a uh, mainstay with a complete rotator cuff tear with non anti-inflammatories and injections. Operative indications can exist for failed conservative treatment, acute traumatic tears for younger patients, and the elderly patient that desires no loss of function with weakness and pain. Please be aware that patient that's elderly with no pain and just weakness and desires more strength can have a recurrence of re-tear and needs to be told and at times perhaps should be considered to avoid surgery. Identification of tear patterns is important. It helps us to understand how we repair them in the operating room. Here seen a crescent shaped tear on the left and a U-shaped tear on the right. If you choose to do a mini open a rotator cuff tear or a deltoid split, as we spoke about before, avoid the axillary nerve at five to seven centimeters. Its pros, some would say, is decreased cost, decreased OR time, although cons might be increased postoperative pain for some and deltoid dehiscence. If you are arthroscopically fixing something and you're curious about double versus single row at the present time, double row has less chance of gap formation 
a higher load to failure, a better footprint contact, and you can do this with a suture bridge technique if you want, giving better footprint contact pressure, but there is no difference in improvement in outcome scores, even though a single row may have significantly higher re-tear rates. For a massive rotator cuff tear, you should expect lag signs. Large rotator cuff tears might have an external rotation drift, a drop sign, or an internal rotation deficit. Here you can see that hornblower sign we spoke about earlier with a massive rotator cuff tear affected by the teres minor or the axillary nerve in the posterior division, giving that inability to raise the arm in the bottom left screen. If you have irreparable tears or failures of rotator cuff surgery, they come in two varieties. You could have an absent posterior superior cuff where the infraspinatus is lost and the supraspinatus is lost. Think of decreased external rotation strength. And you can have the positive hornblower sign because the teres minor and the infraspinatus is affected. If you have an absent anterior superior cuff, Think more of decreased internal rotation strength or increased passive external rotation, maybe with a positive belly press or a liftoff sign. These irreparable tears and failures can be salvaged. If you have a posterior superior defect in a younger patient with motion that's adequate, you can try a latissimus dorsi transfer or perhaps a teres major to greater tuberosity repair, but you know that you must have an intact subscapularis. In a more elderly patient where forward flexion is less than 90 degrees, you may consider a reverse shoulder arthroplasty or perhaps some of the newer procedures without long-term yet studies like a superior capsular reconstruction. If you have an anterior superior defect or internal rotation is affected and the supraspinatus and subscapularis is torn in a younger patient, you can now try a transfer of the pec major to the lesser tuberosity or greater tuberosity. Retears do occur, unfortunately, with a rotator cuff, and we have to warm our patient. And the tear size is probably the most consi consistent predictor of failure. Although there are other factors like age and the ability to heal, tissue quality, we spoke about fat atrophy, repair quality, and smoking status can absolutely affect uh, the completion or the success of a repair of a rotator cuff. Be cautious with infection, and propionobacteria acne, which exists on the skin, must be cultured for 10 days in the correct medium at 37 degrees, and so you need to warn your labs if you're trying to see if this is present, and hold those cultures for the additional days. Complications such as a deltoid dehiscence can be avoided by avoiding a lateral acromionectomy. Here seen in the picture on the right is an axillary nerve deficit. Remember when placing the posterior portal to avoid the suprascapular nerve. And remember that worse outcomes do occur, unfortunately, in workers' compensation patients. They have higher post-op disability and lower patient satisfaction scores. Surgical treatment as contraindicated in rotator cuff disease when one has glenohumeral disease and it is severe. Or perhaps when you have a fixed proximal migration of the humeral head. Consider a reverse shoulder arthroplasty, or if no glenohumeral arthritis is present, perhaps a, gleno, a superior capsular reconstruction. Contraindications for repair might be a chronically retracted fat atrophy grade 4 gouttelier. And when infection occurs, you must get resolution before proceeding in a shoulder. Here you can see a superior capsular reconstruction is going to be a place when anchors were taken out of this humeral head in this young person. Indications for this are irreparable supraspinatus or infraspinatus tears, failed conservative treatment, and you can use perhaps an autograph or an allograph. Fixation is to the supramedial glenoid or the greater or lesser tuberosity, as reported short term with ro low retear rates but no long term follow ups. Here you can see in this author with a thick graph, the medial side is attached to the superior glenoid, this autograph or allograph with two suture anchors, and the lateral side is attached to the rotator cuff footprint on the greater tuberosity in the hope of reducing the relationships of the humeral end head is inferior and not, so to speak, acetabularized on the acromion. No matter what, Good rehabilitation is necessary for the post-operative protocol or even conservative treatment for a rotator cuff with passive motion placed. Avoid internal rotation until four weeks. Think of six weeks before beginning active 
uh, range of motion and continue with active assistive range of motion and gentle strengthening should not occur before eight weeks. It is go slow to get the exact relief for the patient and successful outcome for you. Strength training is important with pain-free, avoid impingement, avoid anterior capsule straps. Avoid the military press scene here on the right hand side, perhaps substitute an incline press. And if you're someone that likes to go to the gym, here are some of the exercises that occur and that are problematic and an alternate exercise for strength training modifications. Orthobiologics are current and most studies in the shoulder for platelet-rich plasma shows no difference except one now in 2011 showing a lower retail rate. Adding bone marrow aspirate or mesenchymal cells in studies most recently did show a faster healing rate than just a rotator cuff placed alone, but it's limited in human data. Muscle ruptures can occur and anterior shoulder pain occurs with a biceps tendon disorder. You can do your physical signs with the Speeds and Jorgensen. Try physical therapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, perhaps an injection, and on rare occasions, a surgical treatment. Here, when surgical treatment is necessary, note the long head of the biceps gave the Popeye deformity. There's weakness in forearm supination and elbow flexion. Cautious should be the word for the biceps that's medial displaced, implying a subscapularis tear, as we spoke about with the comma sign, represented by the avulsed superior glenohumeral ligament, and it can be detected with a belly press or lift-off test, and you need to look for it. Tendon instability of the biceps medially sublux implies that subscapularis rupture, coracohumeral ligament tear, or a transverse humeral ligament tear. Provocative maneuvers can detect this, and treatment with a tenotomy or tenodesis is encouraged. Whether you arthroscopically debride, do a tenotomy, it's unpredictable with a Popeye deformity, but well done in elderly patients, and there are various methods to tenodese, whether subpec or superpec. If a pec major rupture occurs, it's innovation of the pec major, remember, is the medial and lateral pec. It always evulses from the tendon from the insertion. Look for a loss of the contour of the chest and the axillary fold. Repair is direct repair to the bone, and notice the patient will have weak internal rotation and adduction. The AC joint is seen and gives stability both statically and dynamically. Statically, the AC ligaments give you your superior and posterior stability, excuse me, anterior and posterior stability, and it is the superior and posterior ligament capsule that's strongest, no different than the sternoclavicular joint. Superior inferior stability is seen by the coracoclavicular ligaments with the conoid more medial and stronger. AC gen gen joint tenderness can occur with tenting of the skin. Provocative tests with the cross-arm adduction with the arm placed in full adduction at 90 degrees and flexion across without interrotation can often detect an AC joint problem. Plain radiographs with a Zanka view tilted 10 to 15 degrees can be helpful and the MRI is essential because AC joint injuries are commonly associated with slap tears, rotator cuff tears, and fractures, and you need to look for them. Sometimes in AC joint arthritis, imaging does not correlate with disease and be cautious. But if you are going to treat, be careful whether open or arthroscopic in doing a distal clavicle resection to preserve the posterior and superior AC ligaments so that we don't get excessive medial resection to violate the CC ligaments and end up with vertical instability. Weightlifters can demonstrate osteolysis. No history of trauma. These pathophysiological stress reactions of the distal clavicle show localized hyperemia and inflammation with bone resorption. Treatment is more often than not conservatively with non-steroidals, injections, and activity modification. But failed conservative treatment can give a great an excellent outcome with a distal clavicle excision. Dr. Rock would help us to describe the various types of AC joint instability. And more often than not, you need to think about the type 2 or the hockey player that has the AC joint that's hit during a game. It's the most painful because it's not dislocated, so the two surfaces rub all the time grinding, yielding AC joint arthritis. For the grade 3 or grade 5 ear tickler, you can at times, if not treating conservatively, can entertain an allograft hamstring and here with a reconstruction. 
please be cautious. There are many complications that have been reported when reconstructing a type 3 and type 5. And you should practice, obviously, before entertaining this in your own practice. But clavicle resection, we should avoid 1.5 to 2 centimeters, as we did in open procedures years ago. The shaver blade width is only 5 millimeters. And we have to preserve the superior AC capsule. Superior dislocation will occur when the AC ligament and posterior capsule is violated. And so we never want to divide the coracoclavicular ligaments. Scapular winging is seen when the medial scapula and the direction of the inferior pole is listed. As here on the right, this is medial scapular winging, and it involves the, and innervates the serratus anterior palsy with the long thoracic nerve. Remember that innervation of the trapezius is done by the spinal accessory nerve, and lateral scapular winging can occur. Think of the neonate that had the thyroglossal cyst and now has lateral scapular winging. Always detect the scapular winging by describing the inferior scapular pole, as I said, as the way to know if it's medial or lateral. If it's medial and acute, less than three months, strengthen the periscapular muscles like the serratus anterior. Chronically, we can perform a sl split pectoralis transfer with hamstrings, as seen here diagrammatically. For lateral scapular winging, non-operative treatment less than three months strengthens the trapezius, and chronically, we can consider an Eden-Lang transfer when moving these structures, that is the levator and the rhomboids, more medially to bring in that laterally scapular winging. Suprascapular nerve entrapment can occur. It is non-traumatic. Its character is dull pain or sharp pain. Think of overhead workers, high velocity, volleyball players and throwers with weakness on external rotation and a high clinical suspicion. Whether you have compression at the transverse scapular ligament or the spinal glenoid ligament, you can detect different types of atrophy to occur. Here you can see three types, although motion is preserved in all of these patients. And the bottom left shows a florid suprascapular nerve entrapment without atrophy. And so you need ways to detect it, an injection with aspiration, whether you inject at the transverse scapular ligament carefully and perform a cross-body adduction test again and see if the chronic pain is gone, or whether you inject at the spinal glenoid ligament, seen here, four centimeters medial to the posterolateral corner, you can detect this disease entity. But ganglion cysts, while rare, can occur, and they occur at the spinal glenoid notch with the infraspinatus affected with weak external rotation. Look for them on the MRI. Look for the muscle atrophy with the presence of the cyst and a labral tear. Infraspinatus atrophy can occur with suprascapular nerve entrapment, and we have to visualize and can the spinal glenoid ligament arthroscopically. And here you can see we can decompress it as well. The sternocubicular joint can be affected, and subluxation can occur. When it does, in ligamentous lax patient, no intervention is appropriate. For anterior dislocation, acute observation is important, and avoid any pins and hardware. Chronically, for symptomatic treatment, I would like you to ignore the anterior dislocation. On the other hand, posterior dislocation, when acute and painful, without respiratory symptoms, a close reduction can usually occur and it will stay stable. An acute, though, posterior dislocation with pain and respiratory symptoms requires intervention, usually with a colleague like a vascular surgeon, and going to the operating room because there's compression of the trachea and the patient may demonstrate shortness of breath or some strider. Adhesive capsulitis is a painful entity with restricted range of motion. Look for the patient that has associated autoimmune problems like diabetes or thyroid disease, or if non-autoimmune, like cardiac disease or cervical spine disease. The essential lesion as we started this talk today is the coracohumeral ligament that is stretched. It is now fibroplastic process, and the rotator interval is contracted in this entity and needs to be able to be moved. There are freezing phases, frozen phases, and thawing phases, and we have to be aware that this is sometimes a 14-month process to help a patient with adhesive capsulitis. Look on MRI for the secondary signs with elimination of the axillary pouch seen here on the bottom right. More normally, we can see the baggy capsule or axillary pouch, 
And in fact, this is a helpful one for a humeral avulsion of a glenohumeral ligament to look at these types of MRI pictures to understand better in diagnosing our patients. Treatment is more often than not non-operatively for 12 to 16 weeks. You may have to perform an intra-articular steroid injection or oral anti-inflammatories. And if surgical treatment occurs at six months, beware of manipulation under anesthesia for complications. Open or arthroscopic procedures can be done with lysis of adhesions, and we have to open the rotator interval, and we have to do a capsular release. Staging can occur, and we're cognizant of it, and see here that you can now release this arthroscopic procedure of an adhesive capsulitis. Whether you do it open or arthroscopic, complete muscle paralysis is necessary, and postoperatively, using regional anesthesia for physical therapy can be helpful. Calcific tendinitis has three phases, pre-calcific, calcific, and post, and can be detected here as seen on the MRI in a T1 hypo-intense homogeneous signal. You can take this out with surgical treatment. If not tr treated non-operatively, you can attempt to needle it. But if you do excise it and you have a defect present with the rotator cuff, you must repair this and consider completion of the tear and an excellent repair so that patients don't have weakness after treating postoperatively the calcific tendinitis. Lastly, the little leaguer shoulder, epiphyseolysis of the proximal humeral physis, is an overuse condition. It's due to maximum pitching count. Its pain pattern occurs in deceleration and late cocking during phases of throwing. What's important is you can see here on imaging on x-ray the widening physis, the edema at the physis at the hypertrophic zone if an MRI is done. The treatment is no throwing for two to three months. The complications, if not, are physeal fracture or growth arrest. The difficulty with this entity is convincing the parents, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, that the young child has to cease throwing as he is the star on the overhead throwing team. But I encourage you to have them stop throwing so the rest of his life he never has, or her life, any problems and complications from little league or shoulder. This diagram or a slide will show you some of the recommended pitching guidelines for these young great athletes. And I encourage you to use it and hope that it helps. So today we went through many different areas of the shoulder. I hope it is helpful for you. I thank you for your time and I wish you the best of luck as you treat your patients during JBJS MRC recertification course. Thank you.